The title of today's message is Were. Uh, every year about this time, I do a State of the Reunion address. And I'm going to do that today and just highlight a few things before we get into the scriptures. Um, clearly, uh, it looks like we've survived COVID. Um, that was an intense time. Uh, we've gotten back to most of our classes on Sundays here. Um, our week gatherings, we call radius groups, our small groups. And uh, while I'm on those, less. Uh, Vines does such a tremendous job. I think Left's in the room here overseeing that group that leads those groups. So the people that host those groups, that lead those groups, uh, it is the lifeblood of our church and where we connect beyond just a gathering like this. Um, we've got all kind of ministries, women's ministries. Tiffany Thomas has been leading that for a long time, even through some tr struggles with health issues herself. And so, ladies, you couldn't have a better leader than that, and I uh, highly recommend y'all get, get connected with women's ministry. Men's ministry, Rich Reed showed up here a mess, and now he's leading our men and uh, does a, a phenomenal job. And I have men over and over say when they come to our gatherings on the second Saturday of every month that they've never been in a room where men are that vulnerable and that close, and the conversations that happen there and then beyond there uh, the discipleship relationships, um, very powerful. Highly recommend getting connected with the men as well. Missions team, Chris Rodriguez, I think he showed up here, he's 14. I know it wasn't 14, but uh, he's done a tremendous job leading our missions team. And from time to time, people say, well, what kind of ministries are you involved with? And the church's job is not to invent things to do. There are certain things that churches should be doing, no brainer. Um, but we have people from time to time show up here with certain passions. Um, we've got a group now that's part of our church involved with the homeless, feeding the homeless. And so all of a sudden we have lots of people connected to that. So um, ministries come out of people. And so you show up here and you say, well, I have a passion for nursing home ministry. Well, that may not be my passion, but if that's your passion and you, you're doing that and you put the word out, all of a sudden we're doing nursing home. I guess that's what we're supposed to be doing. But it came out of a person, not just a preacher dreaming up something to go do and trying to talk people into doing that. Each of you are gifted, skilled, spiritually and personally to be and do what God made you to do. So you need to pay attention to how those gifts can be used in missions, whether it's local missions, um, nationally or around the world. We support people around the world. Uh, and so I think everybody may be aware of this, but 10% of, of undesignated funds that come in get set aside for us to put seed out there as a church uh, for missions. So when you give here, you're giving beyond here as well. Um, Joseph Lee, a sweet family, Joseph heading up our youth and uh, young adult ministry. And I, you know, I want to remind everyone that this is, this is tricky. We meet downtown, we're an everybody kind of church. And so when families show up and you're Hispanic and you're black and you're rich and you're poor and, you know, all this diversity, a lot of people come from places where Everybody may be the same, or you're used to going to a youth group, and everybody's black, a youth group, everybody's Hispanic, a youth group, everybody's Korean or, or white or whatever it may be. And so when you bring your kids and you say to your kids, look, this may look and be a little bit different, it's true, and it's going to take some adjustment. Um, but if this is where God brings you as a family to our church, then that's part of that process. And everybody may not be like you, but if you end up in a world where everybody's like you, I don't know where you're living. Um, so if, we, if we're going to prepare our kids for reality, then, then part of that process is having them connect when they're young. Uh, Tanya Aragon has been here for decades, literally, overseeing our children's ministry. And uh, so when you see her or anybody connected to that, there are teachers that rotate in and out of there, some that don't seem to get a chance to rotate out of there. But thousands of, of families have been impacted by our children's ministry. And we have volunteers up there who 
just pour out their lives to those kids and, and know that's what they're gifted to do. And part of that process is a buddy system where we have a lot of special needs kids that come through. And so we match up an individual with a, with a young person and they are assigned to them personally. And uh, so we value everybody that comes through the doors up there and appreciate so much what Tanya does. Um, Diane, who runs our office, uh, you have no idea what she does and how much she uh, covers in our office, and she loves to be up on stage, so maybe I should get her up here. I would, uh, I, I, I would lose her in a millisecond if I did that. But when you see Diane, uh, thank her, uh, appreciate her. It's uh, an un, <clears throat> unthankful task at times uh, and very challenging. And believe it or not, our office comes under attack. She, she used to not believe that when she first started. Like, well, that's not, there's no, you know, spiritual attack on an office. Like, she's a believer now. Uh, the enemy comes for us, whether it's electronically or whatever it is, he's got game. And so please pray for her and our office in that regard. Uh, Patrick, I mean, he leads our worship, but does so much more. Our, our, uh, Marriage ministry, he and Tiffany are helpful in that. Sitting down with couples, uh, he and I have been together over 20 years now, which is almost impossible. Uh, so I love him and appreciate so much who he is, what he does, and uh, make sure you thank him as well. Our elders, uh, Patrick's one of those, Joseph and Chad um, do an extraordinary job. Uh, we, we don't have a lot of fights. We don't have any fights, really. So you should be very happy. We don't have anything to fight about. Um, when, you know, financially, we're still intact. Uh, it got close there at the end of the year, and it's not like you can go manipulate people. So if it were not for you all being faithful and responding to the prompting of the Holy Spirit to give the way you give, we don't, we don't exist. And so we do some praying and wait, and wait patiently, and God shows up, and we move it forward. Without these men, I wouldn't want to do it biblically. I shouldn't be doing it. And uh, <clears throat> love them, appreciate them, and the, and all that they offer and bring to the table. Our mission statement has always been disciples making disciples. And just to take a minute on that. Um, I never dreamed that it would be so challenging. There are a lot of things I didn't think would be so challenging. I thought, well, if you just come up with a, the biblical mission statement, couldn't, you know, everybody will want to do that. It's astonishing. The pushback you get on uh, discipleship. We use a book by uh, one of the guys that comes here, John Tolson, Four Priorities, and it's just something we, a tool that we chose to use because he was here, and it's great stuff. And you know, people say, well, I don't want to, I don't want to use a book. And my uh, famous statement to them is, okay, well, we'll use what you use. What do you use? And then their answer is usually, well, what do you mean? Like, well, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you what I mean. You use nothing. You're not discipling anyone. And you say, well, what do you mean discipling? If I said, what do you think it means to be a parent? Well, you, you've made a baby. That's not what being a parent is. Being a parent is making a baby and raising a child that can make a baby and raise a child. So if you look at your life and you can't find those people, you're not making disciples. Yes, you can be putting random information into people's lives, but when I think about making a disciple, I think about Jesus picking 12 guys and telling them to follow him, and I try to keep men in my life that I ask to follow me and pour into them and, and wait to see if they will engage in the process, uh, as Paul told Timothy, teach faithful men who will teach others also. And you'd be amazed at how many people don't want to do this. And I will tell you from personal experience, if you're not making disciples, there's a good chance you're sliding backwards. Because you've you got too much downtime, you're not eating to feed someone else, and it's, it's not a good situation. So... In some ways, I'm encouraged that our mission statement is what it is and that there are some people engaged in that, but we can do a whole lot better in this regard. Uh, we lose some people over this. People get tired of being, you know, badgered or encouraged to make disciples, so they go somewhere where nobody's making disciples and everybody just leaves them alone. That's not, not, not the answer. Uh, the answer is to engage in the process that he left us here to do. So, um, and prayer, none of this 
none of this exists without prayer. Somebody's praying. And so our, our battles are not with flesh and blood, the scripture says. It's principalities and powers, the rulers of darkness in high places. Uh, and the enemy hates this place. Uh, from time to time, we have had people literally come and sit in, in this room and pray against what is being preached from the enemy. Um, so this doesn't go over big in hell, and that's why we get attacked. Um, but we are, we're not backing down. Uh, please pray for the radio ministry locally and nationally, and then now we've added TV on three different networks. And so the gospel is getting pushed out there and some truth out of Scripture, and I'll read you some today that uh, is, is part of why the world gets so disturbed. Um, but we're going to keep pushing the truth in love, and uh, we know that works. So appreciate so much everybody being a part of this. All right, if you would turn to Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6, verse 17. And Paul writing here to this church says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, so you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Um, so nobody likes, you know, slavery is a bad thing in any, any context. Um, why would you want to be owned by somebody? Well, you say, well, I'm no slave to anybody. Without Jesus, you default to slave of sin. You cannot change that. You will do whatever sin tells you to do. Sin owns you. The enemy owns you. But when you become a Christian, that should change. You were slaves of sin, but when you become a Christian, something should change. You obey from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and you are set free from sin, and you become slaves of righteousness. Now you got to do what righteousness wants you to do. And he says he's speaking here in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. So we all know what that means. Uh, the thing Paul also describes this in another place, the thing I don't want to do, that's what I do. The thing I want to, you know, want to do, I don't do. The thing I want to do, I don't do. You know, it's, it's, it's backwards all the time. Um, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness. So what did, we, what did you do when you were slave of sin? You presented your members. Now let's go through this a minute. What do you do with your hands? Um, some of you are thieves. And so as a slave of sin, you present your hands literally as a slave of sin and say, I can't help it. I'm a thief. And so you're constantly stealing things. You may, you may be stealing things at work like time, whatever that may be, but you may physically be taking things that are not yours. You say, well, why am I that way? Because you're a slave of sin. And if you're not a Christian, that will, that, it's probably not going to change. Because you're a slave. You have to steal. Um, if, you, if you're involved in all kind of sexual stuff, and you present your, your members, he says your members, so it's not just your hands. So if you think about presenting every day, you wake up and say to the enemy, okay, I present myself, I'm your slave, and I present my hands, sexual organs, everything I've got, I present it to you, what are we doing today? And then you wonder why your day's so jacked up. Because that's who you are. Now you say, well, that's not who I am. I became a Christian. Then that should be who you were, not who you are. Now you say, but I still have struggles. I get that. But, but, but you cannot be defined by some sin anymore. You're, you're defined by being a slave of righteousness, which the only way to do that is to be, be owned by him. Um, so you did present your members as slaves of uncleanness and lawlessness leading to more lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. 
So let's say it's a Saturday. You, you've got downtime. You're by yourself. You, you're going to get in trouble. You, you've stashed weed. You've stashed alcohol. You've stashed whatever you've got going on, whatever you're, you have been a slave to. And the enemy says, okay, we're going to have a great time today. You're like, no, we're not. Like, what do you mean? Well, I'm not sitting here doing this all day. I'm going to go feed the homeless. So you present your bodies, you present your members to, to do something different, to righteousness. Instead of just sitting around and going, oh, well, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm only human. If you are only human, you're not a Christian. Because when you become a Christian, you are remade in his likeness. You're a new creation. I'll read you that in just a minute. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, if you want to go back at some point and read the first part of this, the first part of, of 1 Corinthians 6 is about taking other Christians to court and suing other Christians, which Paul says, have you lost your mind? And part of what he says here, um, verse 2, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Verse 3, do you not know that we, we shall judge angels? Uh, and then on down, verse 5, he says, I say this to your shame. It, is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren? So if we have issues between each other as Christians, why would we go before a pagan judge when we could have it resolved by a wise brother or sister in the church? You say, well, I don't want that. I want, I want justice. According to this, we as Christians will judge the world one day and even angels. So how are we not going to resolve some disputes among ourselves? Um, so that's the context of this. Then go down to uh, uh, verse 6. Uh, but brother goes to law against brother, and, and that before the unbelievers, before unbelievers. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Now, look at this. Instead of going before a pagan judge, why do you not rather accept wrong? I've been wronged. I'm going to sue you. He says, well, why don't you just accept wrong instead of going before a pagan judge? Keep reading. Why do you not let yourselves be cheated? I got cheated by this guy. I'm going to sue him. And Paul's saying, why would you do that? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat. And you do these things to your brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Now, I'm going to read you a list of what it says in here, and you have to stop being afraid. You don't want to be the list, but you have to, be, you have to stop being afraid of reading this list. The world has gone so crazy, so woke, we don't even want to read these things out loud anymore. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators. What is a fornicator? Someone who has sex outside of marriage. Nor idolaters. Someone who worships idols. Nor adulterers, people who have sex, that are married and have sex with other people. Nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. Look it up. You say, oh my gosh, but the world says this is okay. I don't care what the world says. Look at scripture. Amen. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So... You say, well, what does that mean? I have, if, if, you're, if you say, well, I've committed fornication in my life. I've committed adultery. I, I, I was living a homosexual lifestyle. I was a thief. I was covetous. All these things. It's, it's different to have a struggle with something. It's, it's another thing to be defined by that sin. If, if you are a thief... And that's all you are, and that's how people would describe you. You got a problem. If you become a Christian and you still struggle, you have the enemy tempting you to go back to that lifestyle. That's not the same thing. So let's read this again. This list, list he gives of these items thieves, covetous, nor drunkards, revilers, extortioners in, will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11 And such were some of you. So if I went around just the people in this room and I said, you know, let's go one by one. Uh, fornicators, everybody's committed fornication, raise your hand. Almost, almost the whole room would raise their hand because the world's gone nuts. There's no reason to wait for marriage. And then you go through this list. 
And you say, well, man, I hate seeing, I hate seeing my thing in that list. Is, is, am I in trouble? What does it say in verse 11? And such were some of you. It doesn't mean that's who you are anymore. It's who you were. But if the devil comes to you and says, look, this is not who you were. This is who you still are. There's no way out. If you're a Christian, that is a lie. Stop believing lies. He is telling you that who you were is still who you are. So there's no hope of being who God wants you to be. So you just go back to who you were. Instead of going, wait a minute. Yeah, I was in that list, but it says of such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. And, and I don't do a lot of this, but if you go look up the Greek on this, it's a, it's a past tense. It's a supernatural thing that only God could do. You had nothing to do with it. You were washed. It means it's done. Not you washed yourself. He did the washing. If he washes you, what are you? You are clean, but you were sanctified, set apart. He's got, a, he's got something for you to be and do. And you were justified. You're declared righteous. You're, you're vindicated. It's, it's not guilty. You're, you're free. Now, either that stuff is true or it's not. If you keep believing lies, you will live lies. It's who you were. Okay, let's leave it there. It's who, it's who I were. If we're going to say it wrong. That's who I were. But it is not who I am anymore. So I know most of the people in this room. And I know, I know most of your stuff. I know what you were, but I also know who you are now. You say, but I'm still tempted. So am I. I got to make a decision every day to present my members to him. Just like you do. There's no exemptions. You don't get saved and go, oh, we got you a special, special exemption. No temptation for you till you get to heaven. I don't, I don't ever meet those people. I got people being chased by the hounds of hell, unless they're prisoners of war, and there ain't much chasing then. It's just a lay down. They just say, well, I quit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to my who I were and live that life. It doesn't work. It's, it's, it's exhausting. Sin is exhausting. It's depressing. It'll kill you. There's nothing back there. And you, we've all probably made forays back into the past somewhere and saying, well, I'm not, you know, I want to go back and live that life. Then you get back there and like, what the am I doing back here? There's nothing back here for me. This is who I were, not who I am. I'm going to get all kind of letters over that, I'm sure. <laughs> Instead of writing me letters, don't you listen to the sermon. Oh, his grammar was wrong. <laughs> get a life. All right. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. You know, by the way, this may not sound very encouraging, and some of you are going to argue with this. We were all scumbags. Right? You're like, well, you, I'm, I'm no scumbag. You know, I barely made your list. Okay, Really? I got other lists coming. We'll, we'll get you. We'll get you in one of them. Right? Well, I, I just don't, I'm, I'm not on the level of your scumbaggery. You know, whoever those people are, I don't associate with people like that because I'm not, I'm that, I'm not that deep, that kind of sinner. The book says if you've sinned one, you've done them all. Amen. That's what the book says. You're a scumbag. Now, you may be a saved scumbag, so now you're not a scumbag anymore, but you got capacity for any and all of this. So, you know, hop down off your high horse and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then you can get some help. Because the people who think they're not scumbags, they're not sinners, um, have pride issues. They just don't see that as a problem. 
1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Um, and, 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 and in their case, and this still goes on in a lot of the world, and I, and I don't, you know, don't want to sound disrespectful because I know a lot of people may hear this and go, well, that's, that's my deal. By the millions, there are people who go in and light candles and incense to little statues of animals and people and, and say prayers and think something's going to happen. Your idol is a rock. Your idol is a, is a piece of wood. It's metal. It's gold. It's however fancy it is. It's, it can't hear you. So why are you doing what a dumb idol is telling you to do? You're dumber than the idol doing that. You say, well, that's offensive. I'm trying to help you. We have a living God with ears that can hear, with eyes that can see, with hands that can move, with a heart that loves you and cares about you and was willing to send his son down here to die for you, and the son was willing to come and do it. So you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. But what's the point here? That's not who you are anymore. Um, you, you've been given some spiritual gift. Don't listen to what the enemy's telling you. Listen to what God's telling you to do and let him work in and through you and serve the people around you and change the world. 2 Corinthians 5.17, I alluded to this and I've talked about this recently in another message. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You are not a redo, a do-over. The Bible describes you when you become a Christian as a new creation. In other words, it is something completely different. Out of nothing, it's a new thing. It's not the old me rebuilt. There's a new me that exists. I need to live that life of the new me. The new me does not have to do what the old me said to do. The new me is not required to sin. That is a choice I can make, but I have, I'm not required to sin. I'm not, I don't have some quota. I don't have to go back to what I were. Right? Does anybody have any idea what I'm talking about here? why sometimes I wish I was preaching to black folk because <laughs> there tends to be more of an echo when you say something. But that's all right. Terrence, why are you saying anything? You're not black. <laughs> you don't even know what hooping is. You think that's something to do with basketball. <laughs> Ephesians 2. So I'm reading you, I'm reading us a bunch of verses about the past, but man, look at the contrast. If, if this thing really works, and it does, because i got too many people that are proof of this, Ephesians 2 verse 1, and you he made alive, meaning what? You were dead. Uh, what's that football player that died on the field? Um, Hamlin. You know why they were doing CPR on him? He was dead. He died. You don't try to resuscitate someone unless they're dead. He died on that field. So what did they do? They made him alive. Um, in my sin, I was dead. I wasn't in hell yet, but if nothing changed, that's where I was going to end up. And he raised me from the dead spiritually. He made me alive. So look how he reads, how this reads. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, talking about Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves. Um, even, it's back to what I said a minute ago, even when you meet a really nice person, I hate to tell you, but everybody's got capacity for, for heinosities. You think they don't. Oh, she's such a sweet old lady, she wouldn't harm a fly. But she might be driving down the road gnawing on her steering wheel, you know, wanting to run people over. 
You, you don't know her all the time. You've seen that lady. You know, <laughs> she can drive with her teeth unless they get lodged in there and she loses them. But, um, so look what he says. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were, this were keeps coming up, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And this great little phrase in the scripture, but God, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not you. It's not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, not me doing something to make it happen, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that, that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by which is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hand. So the Jews would say, well, you're, you're uncircumcision because they sized everything up by you've been cut or you haven't been cut. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, there, thereby putting to death the enmity, and he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and those who were and those who were near i'm i'm not that anymore um now let me tell you just kind of in here insert this in the middle if you are a christian and you have and you have gone back to who you were you're trying to live that life and you don't care and that goes on for a, a prolonged period of time. Something's wrong. Something has gone terribly wrong. Because when you are a Christian, you're a new creation, at the core, somewhere, the Holy Spirit of God who lives in you is going to, it is his kindness, his gentleness is going to bring you to repentance. So you're gonna have this pull, you're gonna have this pull. Ungodly people have no pull. Non-believers have no pull. They are slaves of sin. They do what they were born to do, not what they were reborn to do. All they can do is what they were born to do. And so they do that. But if you're a Christian, I don't know what the time frame is on this, but if you're a Christian and you've gone back to who you were instead of who he says you are, and there is no gravitational pull from the king, something's wrong. So you, in the midst of your, your rebellion and your sin, you should find a minute to thank him that you have not completely lost your conscience and, and his voice saying, what are we doing? What are we doing? Why are we out here? Come home, come home, come home. Because you got to go home. There's no one, there's nothing out there. You know that. You prove that in who you were. It does not work. And I sit with people who have no, you know, people say, well, I was, I was born gay. I listen really closely. They say, I was born gay. And I say, you know what? I'll yield on that. You're right. And they go, what? The problem is you've only been born once. So the Bible's full of lists. And you made the list because you were born once and you're a slave to that. Would you be interested in a second birth 
that will overcome all first birth issues. Now, if someone is more connected and identified with their sin than they are their sal- any potential salvation, they will not say yes to Jesus because they love their sin more than anything. Despite God bringing consequence and, and challenge in their life as a result of their sin. And it could be any sin. It could be back to being a thief. Oh, you're a thief. That, you know, I can't stop. Well, I went to prison for being a thief. I can't stop. And then some thief gets saved in, in prison. Does it mean he comes out and he never steals again? It's possible because he's, he's had a second birth that trumps the first birth. So don't be afraid to talk to people who struggle with some sin. They say, oh, but it's not politically correct. I don't care. I care more about you than being politically correct or canceled or whatever they're going to come up with. I'm trying to help you. Your sin will kill you. You're already dead if you're not a Christian. It's just a matter of time. You're already gone. And then somebody tells you that God loves you, that Jesus died on a cross, buried, raised from the dead to save your soul, to change your life, to go from war to who he intends for you to be. And then here we go. Man, I don't want to go back. There's nothing back there except pain and and destruction, loneliness. Go to Ephesians 4. Um, Go down to verse 20. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer. Stop stealing. Stop lying. But rather, let him labor, working with his hands, what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So what? it's not who you were. This is a completely different person. And by the way, even nice people can't pull this off this way. You cannot live the Christian life without Christ. You can't do this, the things that the scripture says to do without him. It, it's, it's impossible to live the Christian life. But with him, you have the power and letting him not just live in you, but through you to manifest all this stuff. All this stuff. By myself, I am, I, you know... I got, I got some possibility of being kind, but I get mean. I can get mean. And not just driving. Right? So impatient. Like, wow, if this, is, this is not Jesus, clearly. This is me, the old me. Well, what's going on here? By the way, make sure you have people around you can call you out. Because if you're a fool and you stay by yourself, you're calling yourself out every time you open your mouth with no one to call you out. Everybody just backs up and goes, please step away from that. It's not going to go well. Get away from, why do you think people want to get away from you? Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 1. Um, and by the way, you know, this is Paul 
over and over writing these things to these Christians for what purpose? Because this is what they struggle with. He's trying to teach them, to help them. Verse 1, therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us and offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or, or, or covetousness, let it not even be named among you. As is fitting for saints, neither, neither filthiness nor foolish uh, talking nor co coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. I got a buddy who's dead now. And, and back in the heyday in Dallas, real estate, he was the king. He was a beast, made millions of dollars, and could tell the dirtiest jokes you've ever heard. And thought it was funny, and everybody thought it was funny around him. And he got saved and started walking with Jesus. You couldn't, get, you couldn't even get him to tell you what the jokes he used to tell not come out of his mouth. They would not come out of his mouth anymore. And everyone knew something had happened to Chuck. He was not the same man. Verse 5, for this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and our God. So he's telling them what he told the, the people in Rome. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of, of disobedience. Don't go to some church where they deceive you with empty words. They won't tell you the truth. They'll tell you, oh, whatever the world says, that's cool. Just give us a little money so we can pay our mortgage. We'll scratch your ears. We'll get our nails manicured so we can do it better. But we're not going to challenge you in any way. How's that going to help you? Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. If you're not darkness anymore, then don't live that life anymore. Stop running with people that are dark and in the dark. If you run with fools, you will be a fool. Run with people who are chasing Jesus, and you'd be surprised how everybody ends up catching Jesus. For the fruit of the Spirit in, is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Um, Colossians 3, go there for the sake of time, we'll cover all these. Colossians 3. So there's kind of three categories of people. You're either not a Christian, um, and you could say, well, I think I'm a Christian. You either are or you're not. And if you think, well, I was raised in a Christian home, good for you. Are you a Christian? Being raised by godly people does not make you a godly person. You personally have to be reborn. So find out, are you a Christian? So you're either a Christian or you're not. Now the middle category is you're a Christian, but you're walking in the flesh. Or the third category is you're a Christian that's walking in the spirit. So you say, well, I'm not, I'm not a non-Christian. Okay, then what are you? Well, I'm a Christian. Which kind? Well, I spend most of my time walking in the flesh. Why are you doing that? How's that working out for you? I know it's not. Well, I just, you know, just, I'm not ready to make that next step. And how long is that going to last? Until your next step is into Jesus' presence, and then you're going to have to explain why you didn't take the next step. Here's the next step, Colossians 3. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. So pursue him. Pursue Jesus, the, th the things of God. Shelby, sitting right here. I can tell you all kind of things that Shelby were. He is not anymore. Praise God. He is chasing after Jesus. He is in the scriptures. He's asking questions. He is pursuing. Does he have temptation? I'm sure he does. Could he go back? Possibly. But that's not who he is. He finally knows who he is now so he can live the life that God intended. That's encouraging to me. 
Because I waited 30 years for Shelby to make that decision. And I can go around the room. But the problem is in a room like this, we still got people stuck in the middle. And you won't move. And this is going this is going to escalate because he chastens those that he loves. Now if you if you're not his kid, it's one it's it's amazing how he doesn't uh, the kids down the street don't get don't get no whoopings. Well, why are you coming after me? Cuz you're my kid, that's why. So you say, well, I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And he goes, okay, really? Well, well, let me show you how that's going to work out. Because I love you, here's the discipline. He keeps turning the dial, keeps turning the dial, until finally you say what? Uncle, time out. I'm, a, I'm out. I'll do whatever you say. So why don't, you, why don't you take the shortcut and say, I repent. Today, right now, I'm, I'm out. I don't want to live that way anymore. I'm back. And, and put the thing in gear and let's go. It's not that your truck's not running. It's, it's just you're sitting there idly. Going nowhere. Keep reading here, Colossians 3. Set your minds on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears. <laughs> I love that phrase. He is our life. When he appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So you say, well, why does the Bible talk about idolatry? It just tells you right there one of the problems. Covetousness is idolatry. You're worshiping a thing. Why does that guy have that house? I want that house. Now you're, you're coveting that person's house that you don't have, and that's idolatry. You've made that house your God. I'm going to get me one of those houses or that car, something. By the way, idols never satisfy. I can line people up on this one. Picked a car, that's, I'm going to get that car. That's, that's what's going to make me happy. And they, find, they sacrifice whatever they got to do, go into debt, and they buy the car, put it in gear, drive off the lot, and nothing, absolutely nothing, empty, didn't satisfy. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked, when you lived in them, but now you yourselves are to put off all these, and he's given some of this list before, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so, also, so you also must do. And then go to Titus, last one, Titus 3. And let's start with verse 1. Remember them to be, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, we were serving those lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Man, get in on some of this. 
I am not who I were any more than you are who you were. Do I have capacity? Could I go back? Um, I'm not saying it's not possible. I have, I have lived long enough now and walked l- far enough with Jesus to know there ain't nothing back there. It's always temporary. It always has consequences. And it never works. Not long term. So, if you're over here in that one category I said where you're completely lost... You're, you, you're not a Christian, you know it, you have no desire for the things of God, but something, your antenna's up, and somebody says something about God loving you, Jesus dying on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead, and now you're listening. I'm going to tell you why you're listening, because that's the power of God into salvation. That is God himself saying, okay, what are you going to do with this? I'm planting a seed, or are you going to let it take? And my recommendation is, as fast as you can, pray a simple prayer. God, I know I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I believe Jesus died on a cross to pay for my sin, was buried, raised from the dead to offer me forgiveness of sin. Eternal life is a gift, a new life. I accept. I accept. I I ask you to come live in me, live through me, change me. I now know that I'm your child. I will spend eternity with you in heaven, and I have the power to live the life that you intended. All that, bam, package deal. Does that mean you'll never struggle? No. You'll have challenges. We all, got, we all got struggles. We all got struggles. I will fight to the finish line. That's okay. But I will hit the finish line. And if you're a Christian, you say, well, what, I'm, I'm stuck. Get unstuck. As my buddy John said, if you screwed up, get unscrewed. to say, no, God, no more. I changed my mind. I want what you want, not what I want, because this is not working. I'm sorry. I confess my sin. I know that you're faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And that, by the way, in 1 John, is written to Christians, not unbelievers. That's for us. And put the thing in gear and let's go. Be who he intended for you to be. Live the life that he intended. Father, thank you. Um, for your word. Thank you for truth in a world that has got this thing so screwed up. We call evil good and good evil. Um, But you still have the power to save. So for anyone who just prayed that simple prayer, God, I know I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I believe Jesus died on the cross, buried, raised from the dead to pay for my sin. I accept the forgiveness of my sin this gift of eternal life free of charge and they know that you have moved in their life you have changed their life everything is different new destination when they die new purpose for this life and now they're going to need some encouragement and some challenge along the way and that's what we're here to do Lord so I thank you for saving the people who have just been saved and Father for Christians who are stuck in the middle I pray that there's movement today There's repentance today. That there may even be some tears over wasted time. And they're ready to move it forward, Lord. Not believe the lies anymore that they can't do anything but live their old life. They have a new life to live. Help them get on with it. And Father, for believers who are chasing you, sometimes we leave that bunch out. I thank you for them. What an encouragement they are. Help us run with those who are running your direction, Lord in packs as a congregation help us be a body of believers who seeks those things which are above at the right hand of the father you lord jesus that we would desire to love you like no one else or anything else to serve you to know you to worship you to thank you to praise you and long to see you and that be what our lives are about not that we don't go to work and make a living but we don't make our work our living our lives, but we know that we are here to bring honor and glory to you and point people to you and serve you as we serve them, Lord. 
and try to draw as many into the net as possible to take them home with us when we go. You're the best. Thank you for being kind and patient, merciful, gracious, and also disciplining us when we need it. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.